All right, Caleb, I'm going to tell you a skill, and you're going to tell me if it's pointless to know or if it's good to know. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. First one, changing a tire on a car. Oh, that's that's good to know. Fractions. No, no. I love math, but pointless. Pointless to know. Dissecting a frog. Pointless to know. When have you ever in your life been like, oh, man, I'm glad I know how to dissect a frog. Pointless to know. No. CPR. Good to know. Um, Not that I, I hope I never find myself in that situation, but I should know it. I should know it. That'd be good to know. Cutting the grass. Cutting the grass. Yes. Good to know. Do your chores. Okay. It's not a free ride out here. Your parents do things for you. Do some things for them. Good to know how to cut the grass. All right. Last one. Reading or writing in cursive. Um, I'm a little biased on that one. Definitely good to know. I grew up learning how to write cursive. And I think the only reason I know how to read it is because I know how to write it. A lot of my friends who don't know how to write it, don't know how to read it. Good. Oh, I say good to know. All right, Caleb, you ready? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Hey, my name's Caleb, and some things might not feel like really important information, but there are some things in life that are really good to know, which reminds me of a time I experienced that in my own life. So I'm in middle school, I'm hanging out with my buddy at his place. I lived in Pennsylvania at the time. It was winter, snow has covered the ground. We got a snow day. We're gonna go have some fun, right? We go sledding, we ride around some ATVs. It's a great time, but my hands are freezing. I go inside, I'm like, let me just warm up, and then I'm gonna make some hot cocoa, right? We'll warm up some water, we'll get the packet. So I go to the stove, I turn it on, and for some reason, it's just not, it's not getting hot. I'm like, what's going on? Like, everybody's still outside, I'm trying to figure it out. Like, let me just leave it on, see if it warms up. I don't know if it's an old stove, it needs to warm up. It starts to smell a little weird in the house, I think nothing of it. I go back to the stove to like, actually try to get it on, and my friend's mom comes into the kitchen, she goes, stop! I was like, what? What's going on? She was like, this is a gas stove. I was like, okay, cool. What does that mean? <laughs> a gas stove is when gas comes out of one compartment of the stove and a lighter lights that gas and then there's literal fire that warms something up. So what I did was I just turned on the gas and I filled their house with gas. I almost set the house on fire. It would have been really good to know that that's how a gas stove works. And today we're gonna talk about something else that is good to know. And it can feel really personal, but church should be the best place to talk about anything, even sex. It's probably gonna make you laugh at times. It might even make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. It's definitely gonna make you think. The good news is that any of those responses are totally okay and totally normal. Our goal here isn't to make you feel weird, scared, embarrassed, or even judged. Our goal is to share the truth you need about the stuff you may not wanna talk about. When it comes to talking about sex, a lot of people usually do one of two things. They either don't talk about it at all, or they talk about it in a way that makes sex seem bad. But here's what I know to be true about sex. God created it, and God made sex a good thing. That means God's not embarrassed or uncomfortable about it. And that also means when we have sexual desires or sexual things we feel, think about, or want to do, we shouldn't be embarrassed either. It's totally normal. It's part of the human experience that God created for us. Now this, this is where the conversation gets confusing because for many of us, it isn't easy to believe God created sex as something good for us to experience one day. We're still left with a lot of questions. To be real, I've heard a lot of questions over the years, even from middle schoolers. Heck, I have my own questions. Questions like, why do we hear so many negative things about sex? Why do we feel ashamed or embarrassed by sex? Why does talking about sex make us feel uncomfortable sometimes? What makes us curious about sex? Is there a right way to talk about or think about sex? What's the big deal about sex? All of these are great questions. They're big questions. And I don't know about you, but to me, it would be good to know the answers. And I think we can start finding those answers by looking at what God has to say about it. Turns out God actually has a lot to say about sex. Yes, you heard that right. We don't have to look that far to see that people have documented God's thoughts about it in the Bible throughout history. It's there at the beginning in the creation of all things. Check out what the author wrote. God created humanity in God's own image. In the divine image, God created them. Male and female, God created them. Okay, so the word sex isn't actually used, but here's what we can learn from this passage. God made humans. Pretty cool, right? Keep reading with me. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. 
That phrase, become one flesh, that the writer uses, that's talking about sex. And the writer also shares this. Adam and Eve were both naked, and it wasn't shameful at all. Sex and sexuality aren't talked about like they're bad things. It wasn't sinful or gross. It was how Adam and Eve, who were married, became close and connected. It was good. So good that Adam and Eve weren't embarrassed at all. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes me feel better right away. Because just like Adam and Eve, we aren't created to be ashamed of the desires, questions, or thoughts we have about sex either. We were created to experience it as part of God's design. In a conversation like this, you're gonna hear me say the phrase sexual integrity a lot. That basically means God's design for us when it comes to sex. Sexual integrity is choosing to respond to the sexual desires we feel, think about, or experience in a way that honors ourselves, others, and God. When we approach any kind of sexual activity or experience with sexual integrity in mind, it's gonna help us make the wise choice that honors ourselves, others, and God. But if that's how it's started, how did we get to where we are now? Well, in the garden with Adam and Eve, they lived in a garden, there was fruit on a tree that God told them not to eat. But guess what? They gave in to temptation and ate it anyway. Adam and Eve had never experienced guilt before because they hadn't gone against God's will. But after they ate the fruit, the way they saw themselves and each other changed. They started to feel embarrassment and guilt. The writer says that Adam and Eve realized they were naked and covered themselves up out of shame. And just like that, sex and the way we view our bodies changed. But that doesn't mean we're stuck. God wants what's best for us. God wants us to love our bodies. God doesn't want us to be ashamed of sex or our sexual desires. When we view sex as something wrong, we aren't seeing it the way God wants us to see it. Here's the thing, sex is good and sex is powerful. And because of that, sex can impact your life in the same way. When you follow God's design for sex, you're following God's best plan for your life. But when you approach it outside of the way God designed it, it can do more harm than good. It can lead to a lot of things you didn't plan or expect. Maybe you already know this to be true. Maybe you've seen or experienced physical, spiritual, and emotional hurt that can come from sex outside of God's plan. Maybe you've seen it change relationships with friends or between parents or even with you and God. Or maybe you've been sexually abused or harassed and it has left you feeling all kinds of things that you didn't want to experience. Let me pause here to say that if you've been mistreated sexually, it's not your fault. God didn't intend for you to be hurt this way. And more than that, God loves you and wants what's best for your life. If you've been mistreated sexually, I encourage you to speak to a trusted adult like a parent, guardian, coach, teacher, or your group leader to help you navigate through your experiences. Maybe you're someone who has already experimented with sex. If that's you, I want you to hear this. I'm so glad you're here because I want you to know that it doesn't change anything about the way God loves you. It doesn't change anything about the way anyone in your youth ministry loves you. They aren't here to judge you or tell you that your decisions are bad or wrong. They're simply here to encourage you to think about what choosing sexual integrity could do in your life and in your relationship with others and God. Because whether you realize it or not, God has a plan for your life, a good plan. And when we trust in and follow God's design for all things in our lives, including sex, we can know that we're experiencing it in the best way possible. Remember, sex is good and sex is powerful. I believe that's true and I want you to believe it too. It's something that's really good to know. So here are two things I want you to do this week. First, Find someone to talk to about sex. We want each one of you to develop a healthy attitude towards sex. We wanna give you a place to talk about it with people who care about you. Is it a conversation for you to have with everybody? No, but it is something to talk about with people you trust. They can help you figure out what sexual integrity means for you. Your group leader, parent, or trusted adult you live with is a great place to start. Then be brave enough to start talking. Once you identify someone you can trust to start this conversation, be brave enough to do it. Will it be awkward sometimes? Probably. But will it be good for you to start the conversation? Absolutely. My prayer is that you'll be brave enough to start talking about sex and sexual integrity today. Because the more we talk about it, the easier it'll become to keep talking about it. Your group is a great place to continue the conversation because there you're surrounded by people who want to love you and support you. They wanna help you navigate the stuff that's good to know in a way that's good for you. 
Remember, sex is good and sex is powerful. 